63. Psalm 63. And uh, of course, we are looking once again this afternoon at another of the Beatitudes, the fourth in our series, and we're looking at uh, the Beatitude of blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And for this we want to read Psalm 63 as a little bit of a scripture background, a little Old Testament context reading. Psalm 63 is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And David pens these words, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory but the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. And in preparation for the hearing of God's word, we turn in our hymnals to number 217. Oh, praise the Lord, for he is good. It's based on Psalm 107, number 217. Oh, praise the Lord, for he is good. We rise to sing the three stanzas.
is our text for this afternoon, what we'll be preaching on, Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. In Church of God, loved by the Father and kept by Christ Jesus, when Jesus taught, as we know, he would quite often use images, imagery, that people would be able to capture with their minds because they were familiar things that they, they saw and they experienced and they knew of on a day-to-day -day basis. Hunger and thirst, sadly, was one of the things that people in that time and age and culture knew very much about. These, of course, were different times and a different place to what we are used to. The most we may experience hunger today, maybe having to wait an extra 30 minutes because supper is late, or having to sit an extra 10 minutes in a drive through Thirst may simply be that we forgot to take a bottle of water with us in the truck, so we have to look for a gas station to pull over to buy a bottle of Aquafina or Gatorade. In ancient times, in the times when the Bible was written, it was much, much worse than that. People actually planned their lives around food and water. You worked that day so that your family might eat that day. And sometimes you didn't work. Or maybe there just wasn't food available. In Bible times, there could be famines and droughts that could wipe out crops. And people died. Water in that hot and dry climate was also a challenge. And so you lived where water was accessible from a well or from a river. And if you were traveling, which means by foot or by donkey in those days, you had to plan to have enough water and arrive somewhere in time so you could get more water. And so when Jesus speaks to his listeners about hungering and thirsting, they knew what he was talking about by those terms. They had experienced this. They knew what it felt like to want food or water to such an extent that it was life itself. You needed it to survive. But Jesus uses this imagery to encourage them and us about a much greater need. That is, for righteousness. And we'll talk about what that means in a bit. But here, he paints a picture for us of something that should really exist in every human heart. But of course, it doesn't. Sin restrains people from seeing this great lack in their lives. But those in whom the Holy Spirit of Christ lives, there is a recognition in our hearts that we need righteousness. And we crave it. We hunger for it. We want it, and we want it more. And it's a source of frustration for us when we don't get it. But Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. In other words, to paraphrase what he's saying is to his church, if you are experiencing such misery, that is, if your lack of righteousness is a daily and constant burden to you, take heart. Blessed are you. You are among the favored of God. You shall be filled. You shall be satisfied. Your hunger and your thirst shall be relieved. Our theme, as we look at Matthew 5, verse 6 this afternoon, is this. Jesus proclaims the blessedness of those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Jesus proclaims the blessedness of those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. We'll see in the first place their identity. And in the second place, their promise. But as Jesus proclaims the blessedness of those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, we see in the first place their identity. In other words, who are the blessed here? How do we identify them? Or to get more personal, how do I know if I am one of those people who hunger and thirst after righteousness? Well, in order to answer those kinds of questions, we have to look at these words and in their context to see what they mean. Now, the word hunger in that context, as Jesus uses it here, does not merely mean that feeling in your stomach that tells you it's supper time or lunch time. It doesn't describe feeling snackish around nine at night. When Jesus speaks of hunger here, he's referring to the craving for food when there is no food available. This is the kind of hunger that Israel would have experienced in the wilderness when they left Egypt. And we can read about that in Exodus 16. Hunger to such an extent that they accused Moses and Aaron of bringing them out into the wilderness to kill the whole bunch of them. 
Jesus himself would have experienced that kind of extreme hunger during his temptation in the wilderness, which was, by the way, a reenactment of Israel's experience. We know that just before the temptation of Jesus, he had fasted for how long, boys and girls? Forty days and forty nights in the wilderness. And the Bible says that he was hungry. Imagine how hungry you would be after 40 days, 40 nights not eating at all. So hungry was Jesus at that time that Satan even tried to tempt him to turn stones into bread. But of course, this was a test. As Israel was tested in the, in the desert, but as Israel failed, Jesus passed his test. This is the kind of extreme hunger Jesus is talking about here in this beatitude. People in Bible times knew what it felt like to experience real hunger. They had no fridges and cupboards full of food. There was no store to go buy things. And, and may, you may not even have had the money to, to buy anything anyway. For a lot of people in that time and culture, hunger was a daily experience. Quite often, they were not even sure if they would eat that day at all. But Jesus also talk, th talks about thirst. And the kind of thirst he's talking about here is extreme thirst. Thirst where you become dehydrated to the point that you think you are almost dying. The climate, of course, in that part of the world is very hot and water is scarce. There were no pipelines in that time pumping millions of gallons of water into cities. If you traveled, you had better know where the wells were or how far to the next village, or you would most certainly perish. If you've ever seen pictures of people in places where there have been drought, or if you have ever been somewhere where you didn't have quick ac access to water, you know the desperation that people can feel. You need it. You have to have it. Now, Jesus uses that imagery to speak about something even more important than actual food and water. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So what is this righteousness that we may hunger for? Well, the word in the original language was used to describe someone who did what was expected of them. Who did what was expected of them. They kept the law or they lived according to the social norms of their society. In the Christian context, then, righteousness refers to those who live obediently before God, who obey His law. But right away we see the problem, don't we? Because which of us would say that we do that perfectly every day? Instead, what do we see in ourselves? We see sin against God every day in thought word and deed. Now, as we said, for most people, they don't see that. If you ask the average Joe on the street, if he thinks that he lives in rebellion against God, he will say, of course not. I'm a good person. I used to say that before I was a Christian. But you ask someone that same question, in whom the Spirit of Christ lives, and you get a different answer, don't you? He says, he or she says, of course I am. I'm a rebel before God. Man, I sin so much every day, I can't stand myself sometimes. I hate it. I wish I could do better. God is faithful, but I sure am not. And you see, the child of God experiences this. You know what you ought to do. You know that God is righteous and that you need to be righteous to have a relationship with God, but you don't see that righteousness in yourself. And you long for it. You crave it. You hunger and you thirst for it as if you are starving and dying of thirst. You long to be right with God. You long to walk in His ways. And David spoke in Psalm 63 of his soul thirsting, his flesh longing for God. Now at this time, David was on the run from King Saul, hiding in the wilderness of Judah. And we have to understand where David is coming from here. You see, to an Israelite, to be away from Jerusalem, to be away from the tabernacle, to be away from the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, to be away from the place where the priests performed their duties of sacrifice at the altar, for an Israelite to be away from such places was torture. To be away from the place that God had designated to worship Him was, in an Israelite mind, to be away from God. And so David 
hungered and thirsted for God in the wilderness. He pined away to be in the presence of God and to be able to worship God. Now that's an Old Testament picture or foreshadow of this beatitude here. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And part of our conversion, conversion is when the Holy Spirit changes our hearts so that we go from loving the world to be, and we begin to love the Lord. And we begin to be, to be conscious of our sins and we begin to ask ourselves who is Jesus and why do I need Jesus? And then we know conversion is happening in our lives and we, we're asking questions, we're searching the Bible, we begin to, to wonder, how am I saved? How can I have a relationship with God? Well, part of our conversion experience is to experience that kind of longing, that kind of hunger and thirst for God. People who come to, to the faith later in life will tell you how driven they felt to know the answers to questions that burned in their hearts. Questions like, is there a God? If there is a God, how can I know Him? Is the Bible true? Can I trust this? Is there any hope for me? I'm such a wicked person. Does God even want me? You hunger and you thirst. And all through our lives, brothers and sisters, we know that as Christians, these questions arise, they surface in our lives again and again and again. We know what righteousness is. We know something of the holy character of God, but we don't see that holiness in ourselves that we would like to see, that we think should be there. And so we hunger and we thirst. We want to be in a right relationship with God. We want to know that we are right before Him and we want to live righteously as a child of God. But then we read passages like Psalm 24, verses 3 to 4. And we hear words like this, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And we read such words and we get discouraged and we get frustrated because we say, I don't have clean hands and a pure heart. I wish I had that, but I don't. Or we read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 and following, where we're told to put off lying and anger and stealing and corrupt words and bitterness and lust and covetousness. And then we look at ourselves and we see so little of that in us. Or we see inconsistency in our lives. And we hunger and we thirst for righteousness. And yet we hear in this verse, Jesus say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you see, the frustration we feel, the longing we experience, Jesus teaches here is actually good. He's teaching us here that this is normal for the child of God. It's a good indication that our faith is real and that we crave righteousness with a ravenous hunger and unquenchable thirst that can only belong to a child of God. And blessed are you. And thankfully, that's not where it ends. There is hope for those who are spiritually hungry and thirsty. Jesus says here, let's listen again, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so as Jesus proclaims the blessedness of those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, we see in the second place their promise. That is, the promise that is given to those who suffer in this way. Some translations say, they shall be satisfied. And that gives a good indication of what Jesus is promising here. The word, the Greek word translated filled, refers to a feeding till there is no more want. A feeding to satisfaction. The same word is used, in fact, in Matthew 14 and 15, where we read of Jesus feeding the 4,000 and the 5,000 people. And both times, in both passages, both accounts, we hear these same words. They all ate and were filled. Same Greek word. No one, in other words, was left feeling, you know, I could have eaten a little bit more if there was more, but at least I got a little bit. I'll just be glad that I got some. No. 
We read both times in those passages, everyone ate to their fill. They ate till they could eat no more. We could almost imagine or picture the disciples saying, when everyone had eaten to their fill, seconds anyone, thirds anyone, more anyone, and people saying, oh, no, no, no. I couldn't touch another bite. I am just stuffed. That's the picture we get here. And that's the promise that Jesus gives to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. Their hunger and thirst will be satisfied to the point where they feel they lack nothing. Total and absolute satisfaction. This is something that will be done for them, and it is God who will do it. It's not something that we have to do for ourselves. God will do it. Of course He will. He has always been the one who supplies the needs of His people. We mentioned a little while ago Exodus 16 and the hunger that the people experienced in the desert. And in Exodus 16, it records that the people were so hungry that they were ready to riot. Their stomachs were grumbling with hunger. Their children were fainting with hunger. And they were in the wilderness. There was nothing to gather, nothing to pick, nothing to hunt, nothing to catch. They were in the desert. But beloved, this is the kind of situation where God works best. Think about that. If you ever find yourself in a position where there are no safety nets, no one to run to, no one to help you, no solution that you can find, that's where God works best. In the wilderness, in the desert, where there was no food to be had, God then promised His people to rain bread upon them from heaven. And he would send quail beyond number so that they could eat meat in the wilderness. And then in Exodus 17, we read of God commanding Moses to strike, of all things, a rock. And water would come out of that rock for his people to drink in the desert. And so they could eat and they could drink to their satisfaction. That's the kind of filling that God does. That's what God does for His people. But in the Bible, food and drink are also used as pictures of a greater, deeper need. And Psalm 107 helps us to see that as it, as it records the provision of God for Israel in the desert. In Psalm 107, listen to verses 4 through 9. It, kind of, it recounts the, the wilderness experience of Israel. Psalm 107, verse 4 to 9. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them out of their distresses, and He led them forth by the right way that they might, they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works to the children of men. And then listen to verse 9. For He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. And so God, we're reminded here, we're shown here in Psalm 107, God is not merely some divine server waiting upon us, making sure that we eat and drink food and, and water when we need it. He satisfies the longing soul. He fills the hungry soul with goodness. Or to put it plainly, he supplies the righteousness we need to feed and quench our hungry and thirsty hearts. A righteousness that we could never attain on our own. Paul sets this out for us as to how God does that in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Romans 3, verses 21 to 26. And in the preceding verses, he just tells us how awful we are how fallen and lost we are. There is no hope in us. There is none righteous, none who does any good. But then comes the good news. Romans 3, starting at verse 21 to verse 26. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so how does God ultimately satisfy that hunger and thirst we have in us for righteousness? He gives us his son, Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us here that in the law, there is only the knowledge of sin. Striving to attain righteousness through law-keeping only leads to frustration. We will always come up empty, but God has provided. He set forth Jesus as a propitiation for us. That is, a sacrifice to appease his anger, to atone for our sins, and so to provide a perfect righteousness for us. That's why Jesus could speak this way in the Gospel of John chapter 6, verses 48 to 51. John 6, 48 to 51, he says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in, in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And then in uh, John 7, verse 37b, Jesus says this, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. No one can satisfy our hunger and thirst for righteousness like Jesus. We hear in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so even though we still now see unrighteous thoughts and words and deeds in ourselves, in the sight of God through Jesus Christ, we are righteous. We are, to use the language of the New Testament, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. In Philippians 3, Paul speaks of his hope being found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in him. The righteousness which is from God by faith. And this righteousness that God provides satisfies like no other and beloved, this is just a foretaste. There is a greater fulfillment to come of the promise of Jesus here. There is a final vindication at the second coming of Jesus. And Paul talks about this in Galatians 5, verse 5. He speaks of believers through the Spirit eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness by faith. Something to come. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Revelation 7 even uses Matthew 7 language to teach us of the blessings of eternal life in heaven with God. In Revelation 7, verses 16 to 17, listen to this. Speaking of those who are in the new heavens and new earth, they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living found fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What a glorious picture. Indeed, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. God shall fill us now through faith in Jesus Christ, and he will fill us later in the new heavens and earth. In congregation, what we have before us once again is a beatitude that really defies the way, normally, the, the way uh, people normally think. People don't normally count as blessed those who hunger and thirst. They would count them as wretched. They would count them as to be pitied, in need of help, in need of compassion, in need of charity. Not so with God's children. To hunger and thirst for us that is, to long and to yearn for the comfort of knowing that we are reconciled to God, that we belong to Him, that our eternal destiny is secure. To hunger and thirst for us is good. We are blessed because with those feelings of, of helplessness come the promise that we shall be filled. And so, beloved of God, I ask you this afternoon, 
Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do your sins frustrate you? Take comfort. If you believe in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, know that God has provided all that is needed to our complete satisfaction and continue to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what if you say this afternoon, I haven't really experienced anything like what I would consider hunger and thirst for righteousness in my own life yet? Well, then we need to pray for it. We need to pray that God by His Holy Spirit would show us our spiritual emptiness and that He would show us how easily He can fill that emptiness with His Son, Jesus Christ. Again, let's be reminded that we're not to think that we're okay just because we do certain things and that we are right with God. Every heart here this afternoon needs to be changed. Conversions need to happen. Every one of us needs to see that we are sinners in need of God's forgiveness. We need to see our hunger and our thirst. But here's the good news. In the process of seeing it, we will be blessed. I'll end with the words that we began with this afternoon. God's call to each and every one of us. Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here, and your soul shall live. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glorious promises of the Holy Bible. And we pray that what the Bible teaches may be our experience that there may be in us a hunger and thirst for righteousness increasingly, but that by your Holy Spirit, not only may we see our misery, but also our joy, as you show us the Lord Jesus Christ and what you have done for him, for us in him, and how you have established and provided a righteousness for us that we could never gain for ourselves. We pray that your Spirit, by his mysterious power, would cause the gospel promise to enter into our hearts this afternoon, that we may look to Christ, that we may long for him, that we may desire him, and that we may come to him and confess him as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Number 420 is our song of application, Come for the Feast is Spread. Number 420, we rise to sing stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 5.